Fantastic. Okay, well, yeah, that's everyone sort of in so far. So hello and welcome to the first seminar in the French Realism series. It's really good to see you. So, so much interest in these seminars. And thank you to everyone for turning up today. And before starting properly, I'd like to note that these seminars would not have been possible without the encouragement and support from Dr Ian James and Dr Martin Crowley in the French section here at the University of Cambridge and Professor Andrea Bellantone uh, from the Catholic Institute of Toulouse. And I'm very grateful to them for making today possible. We're very lucky to have Katrina start the series and of course extremely grateful to her for agreeing to join us. I've been looking forward to this uh, for a couple of weeks now and I'm delighted to introduce her today. Um, so I'll say a few words of introduction and then hand you over to Katrina after <clears throat> and then after her talk Ian will offer a short 20 minute response and there will then be time for a few questions before we finish at half past three which is uh, about an hour and a half from now. Okay, so Katerina is the author of six books, most recently, uh, Capitalism's Holocaust of Animals, a non-Marxist critique of capital philosophy and patriarchy, published by Bloomsbury in 2019. Other works include Toward a Radical Metaphysics of Socialism, Marx and Arwell, published in 2015, and The Cut of the Real Subjectivity in Post-Structuralist Philosophy, published the year before. Uh, recurrent themes and questions in her work concern subjectivity, embodiment, gender and identity in critical dialogue with post-structuralism and post-humanism. What separates Katerina's engagement with Francois Larouel's non-philosophy from many others is her insistence on the potential Larouel's thought offers for revolutionising metaphysics. Put in the simplest terms, uh -huh, the practice of non-philosophy opens the door to the consummation of the Marxist revolution in philosophy by placing metaphysics in the service of man and not the other way around. And this for me is what makes Katrina's work so exciting and I look forward to hearing what she has to say this afternoon. You know, I, I, don't, I think that's probably enough from me. So I'll just sort of hand you over now to uh, Katerina, so thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrew, for, for this invitation and for this initiative. I, pull up, I apologize to everybody who was expecting an actual French person. Uh, as uh, in the case of French feminism, there is always somebody with a Ova or Eva at the ending who represents <laughs> French uh, feminism. Okay, this is not exactly feminism, what I will talk about. Uh, and of course, my joke is in reference to uh, Julia Kristeva or Kristeva. Now there is this Kolozova talking about uh, French realism, no, not feminism, as in the case of uh, Kristeva, but we're both feminists apparently. Uh, so it's kind of uh, there is an analogy in this uh, uh, combination, and uh, um, I hope I'm not disappointing anybody, but not by not actually being French and still talking about French theory. Uh, so, um, the, yeah, the, the presentation of Andrew was, um, yeah, I think that it summarizes uh, the main themes, the main concerns in, in my work. Um, uh, in particular, this uh, critical dialogue with post-structuralism gender has been uh yeah a recurrent theme but not so central anymore as it used to be as in the cut of the real so in the talk today i mean you, you could anticipate that from the title we are going to tackle some more general questions uh, or perhaps Laurel would call them uh, generic uh, notion um, from the critical perspective uh, provided by a combination of uh, Marx and Francois Laurel uh, offering a glance at what makes the let's call it intellectual economy in philosophy itself as a form of uh, cognition and a form of narrative uh, creation and capitalism uh, itself as, um, as a, 
a type of reason, uh, rationality, uh, perhaps even kind of a metaphysical foundation that justifies it or uh, prefers a sense to it, uh, how these two categories could be likened to the extent of finding some uh, almost perfect or um, uh, no, uh, next to it uh, coincidences, correspondences, resonances between the two types of thought, capitalist and philosophical, and two types of systems of value production, because this is how we treat them here. Uh, now, in the book, there is uh, a whole introduction as to how the notion of automaton is used. Uh, we don't have the time for its lengthy intro. Uh, when we reach uh, in the presentation uh, the term, if it, 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 uh, a use of a term which might, might not be uh, sound clear, then I'll uh, offer some explanation, a background to uh, as to how I employ this notion in the argumentation. So uh, let's uh, start uh, with the following argument. So um, let me turn off this notifications, I'm sorry. Uh, so I argue that there is no such thing as epistemological break, uh, an idea made pretty famous by Althusser in, in particular. Uh, so I argue that there is no such thing as a epistemological break in Marx. As the themes that according to this theory of the epistemological uh, break um, appear uh, uh, in one st uh, stage of his thought, but not in the other, are quite to the contrary, I argue, something that keeps uh, resurfacing in, you know, throughout his uh, work. It, it, uh, perhaps the, the language changes with time. But the themes are there, there. So the opposition nature versus abstracted or alienated idea, uh, matter uh, for which uh, uh, Marx more often uses the term real and physical, uh, avoiding matter itself, uh, because of this, uh, uh, because of his. Um, cautious attitude toward the philosophical materialism of his era and Feuerbach uh, therefore uh, shies away uh, from uh, the use of the term, even though no, of course not completely, his doctrine is materialist, materialist but he seems to prefer, prefer real and physical as synonyms to matter. Then uh, the, team, the theme that uh, keeps resurfacing uh, is a recurrent uh, question uh, in his works, uh, regardless of whether early or late, uh, is um, materialism on the, one, uh, on the one hand and speculation on the other hand. So surplus value and the related error of fetishiz fetishizing reification of surpl surplus value than subjectivity versus subjectivity. Uh, this talk of objective science keeps re, uh, resurfacing uh, is a recurring, uh, recurrent question and is the epistemological foundation throughout uh, his work. Uh, this uh, slight digression about the, the, the epistemological break is here to serve uh, um, as an explanation that uh, the, uh, the dismissal of uh, the humanist argument in Marxism as something that can be ascribed only to his early work as, uh, and as something that, uh, that ought to be considered as completely irrelevant for his uh, uh, later work, uh, more mature work, uh, is uh, in, in fact a flawed argument. It does not hold. So that uh, uh, 
that a digression, digression in the discussion uh, was meant to explain this position so that we could move more um, uh, with more ease uh, in the, in the elaboration of the thesis in this paper. Uh, so <clears throat> these themes are recurrent and they underpin the entire opus organizing it as a coherent whole. Uh, Marxist humanism has always been about materialism, which in turn Marx often and unequivocally reduces to naturalism. The latter is true not only of the early writings such as philosophical economic manuscripts, but also of German ideology and Grundrisse. Uh, Marx's treatment uh, and capital as well, uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, Marx's treatment of the concept of use value as we find it in Grundrisse, for example, page 114 of the edition I'm using here, is grounded in the attempt of materialist or physicalist vindication of value as such. In order for a value not to be a self-standing abstraction, um, so this is his target. And in this sense, uh, he seems to uh, be concerned with the same problem as Laruel when it comes to what uh, constitutes philosophy in its, uh, not in its, uh, uh, in the most general sense, but in the most radical sense of the, the word. Uh, so, uh, in, so here, uh, in order for a value not to be a self-standing standing abstraction, uh, it draws its sense from the physical use of the produce, food, shelter, etc. Each commodity is produced to serve the physical and sensuous, as Marx argues in the philosophical economic manuscripts. So the physical and sensuous needs such use of produce is called use value and, it's deter and it is determined by concrete bodily form. Use value is nurturing and protecting the physical self as selfhood itself is in the last instance determined by physicality too. And that is why my Marx claim, claim, ex, exclaims, I'm sorry, not claims, exclaims in philosophical and economic manuscripts. This communism as fully developed naturalism equals humanism and as fully developed humanism equals naturalism. But further on, we, we will see that his humanism is not uh, philosophical. Uh, and um, his radical notion of the species be, uh, be, being of humanity is in fact uh, more uh, post-structural, it goes more beyond the uh, self, uh, philosophical self-sufficiency of the discourse of uh, uh, post-structuralism as we find it in a critical theory. Uh, we will see further on how come. And uh, this perspective uh, on uh, Marx's argument is provided by uh, Laruel's, uh, or, let's say, methodological organ. Um, so the same argument resurfaces in the first volume of Capital and its critique of commodity fetishism or critique of abstracted materiality or the abstraction of materiality. And finally, in, in Marx's critique of automation of abstracted human labor, we find in Grundrisse. This is a quote from Grundrisse. Once adopted into the production process of capital, the means of labor passes through different metam metamorphoses whose culmination is the machine or rather an automatic system of machinery. System of machinery, the automatic one is merely its most complete, 
most adequate form and alone transforms machinery into a system set in motion by an automaton, a moving uh, power that moves itself. I'm still quoting, but now uh, I'll intervene and uh, simply to uh, give you heads up that uh, he's uh, referring not literally to the machinery in the factories, but uh, the automaton of value production of capitalism, which is, enable, which is enabled by this complete abstraction of everything, of value as abstract value, surplus value, labor as uh, abstract notion, uh, quantifiable in uh, monetary value. So uh, all this constitutes a certain uh, automaton of value production. In that sense, the automaton he's talking about, Marx is talking about here, is very similar to the automaton Lacan talks about of you know uh, the pleasure principle which is an automaton of signification and it's also very similar uh, to uh, the signifying automaton we find in so serious linguistics so actually it's about signification so value is also about signification and uh, it seems that Marx is making an argument uh, that uh, resurfaces or is rediscovered or discovered perhaps uh, much later on by Saussure and Lacan and uh, others that I mentioned uh, just now and I mentioned in the paper. Uh, so this is just my intervention in brackets in this quotation so that it's easier to follow. Uh, the further argument. So uh, it is set in motion by an, by an automaton, a moving power that moves itself. This automaton consisting of numerous mechanical and intellectual organs so that the workers themselves are cast merely as conscious linkages, as if in a, an AI economy. Uh, in the machine and even more in machinery as an automatic system, the use value, the material quality of the means of labor is transformed into an existence adequate to fixed capital and to capital as such. <clears throat> uh, in no way does the machine appear as the individual workers mean, means of labor. So uh, in capitalist ontology, uh, apparently, uh, uh, the automation is dematerialization of the production process, annihilation of use value in favor of purely abstract value, whereas human labor or workers are mere conscious linkages of the otherwise dead automaton, lifeless uh, automaton. Um, and uh, this uh, formulation is used elsewhere in uh, precisely the same text in Grundrisse. So, and he likens the, 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 the formula uh, MCM, money, commodity, money, to death, life, death. Uh, okay, so according to Marx, the industrial production in its materiality which includes the human body and mind too, is part of the universal machine of capital. And it is, <clears throat> it is a self-sustained universe without the need of human skill to guide it. In a way, it emulates the abstract uh, egoist, egoism raised in its pure abstraction of philosophy. Uh, this is a paraphrase from Marx's critique of Hegel's philosophy in general. Uh, that is the subjectivity centered reason as reason of philosophical humanism. So the prime mover of the capitalist automaton of value production 
is generalized reason shaped by philosophical humanism and the post in the prefix of post-humanism does not move it beyond its determination in the last instance. This self-standing abstraction is the core of capitalist ontology based on the simple gesture of generalization of a purely philosophical abstraction of human subjectivity epitomized in Hegel's absolute spirit. So humans are the necessary conscious elements built into the automaton so they can serve the function of the conscious linkages of oversight of the automated operations. It sounds very contemporary, by the way, or as our immediate uh, future, impending future of uh, what we expect to be a fully automated AI uh, industry, economy, something uh, to come to full realization globally, I expect relatively soon. So in that sense, it's very interesting how prescient uh, Marx's argument is. So the worker is part of the process only to be used as a form of means of production, as part of the fixed capital or uh, the material required for the machine of capital. So here you can see the transformation from an agency to a resource. The worker is part of the process, only to be used as a form of means of production, as part uh, of the fixed capital, as he calls it, or, you know, the machines uh, in the industry. So the human is the, the, this conscious linkage there. Um, and that's what the logic of capitalism itself dictates. It's unavoidable. Uh, and uh, so Marx simply accelerates the logic of capital to arrive at this realization that soon this automaton of capital will be self-sufficient. Humans would be, uh, uh, or workers would be mere conscious linkages and soon to lose the status of uh, agency apparently, because obviously according to this uh, logic of acceleration or you know the acceleration is something actually that uh, that is inherent in capital itself uh, so it's not even something to uh, that Marx advocates for or things that should be you know pushed for uh, through policies or whatever um, uh, the logic is that the acceleration takes place uh, you know um, imminently uh, in how capital uh, operates and this would be perhaps the stage of the final contradiction of capital as he would put it uh, whereby the you know the worker would soon become resource mere resource so you know the, the status of agency will start fading away slowly um, uh, this uh, accelerating logic is finally uh, formalized uh, uh, in uh, capital. I don't know. The, I think he insists on it in the second volume, but that's throughout that, you know, MCM uh, arrives very soon to M to M prime. So the C is expunged from the formula as human uh, labor or human labor as an agency as worker might uh, soon be so this is anticipated in the very logic of the automaton of capital uh, in uh, Marx's own writings so here is another quote uh, uh, from Grundtvig again uh, he says the circle money commodity money uh, sorry money commodity commodity money 
which we drew from the analysis of circulation would then appear to be merely an arbitrary and senseless abstraction, roughly as if one wanted to describe the life cycle as death, life, death, uh, end of quote. Um, and yet again, writes Marx, the senseless abstraction of death, life, death has at least some relation to nature, referring to the process of decomposition of the individual body and self, back to the elemental. The reference to a natural process reduces the senselessness of death, life, death uh, abstraction. <clears throat> it's less senseless. Uh, whereas money, commodity money is, however, irreparably senseless as it does not find its determination in the last instance in the material as natural. If a value is merely surplus value rather than use value, that is value that is materially realized, it forms a circuit of an onto-referential abstraction. Use value is not what moves capital, but rather the surplus value or simply pure value. That is why the exchange comes down to M to M prime, which is the reason for Marx to identify it as senseless because the tautology is evident. Moreover, it is senseless because abstraction cannot pretend to be other than, than, uh, than an intellectual means a faculty and instrument of cognition, a process that is materially determined in the last instance. That would be the scientific uh, position that Marx uh, embraces. And, you know, he keeps trying to move away from philosophy throughout his work. So, uh, and he does define it as the product of, you know, the physical banality of nerves and muscles, etc. So it is neither a purpose nor a cause reason. Uh, it is, uh, you know, the product of human cognitive activity. That's all it is. It's not a self-standing entity as the spirit in uh, Hegel and in so much of, you know, the history of philosophy. Uh, so the spirit, reason, or meaning, when Marx refers to them, are also uh, materially enabled. Uh, so Ma Marx makes sure that his critique of the flawed metaphysics of capitalism is not misread as romantic vitalism. The contempt, and therefore the epistemic fallacy, to disregard the bodily aspect of human production, including the means of production, is what underpins capitalist logic as moved by surplus value only. Whereas the use value remains outside the capitalist equation. Uh, the subjection of the worker of her body and spirit made of muscle and nerves, as Marx says, uh, to the automated machine of capital is subjection of nature to the senselessness of the MCM abstraction. Uh, this concern as central stretches throughout Marx's opus, beginning with his early works, surfacing in the communist manifesto and as demonstrated reappearing in Grundrisse. Uh, of uh, 1857 uh, 58. The contradiction of the capitalist bourgeois conception and practice of production becomes evident precisely through the tension between capital, both as aut automation or the automaton I talked about, and the physical reality of machines used in the production. On the one hand, and the worker as physical reality and nature on the other hand. Okay, let's move to the section focusing on the problem of subjectivity centered thought as uh, an, a problem even to uh, philosophy as such and also a legislating pre principle of uh, capitalist reason. <clears throat> so,
so again, uh, the notion of subjectivity as uh, an underlying problem of uh, a structure of thought that produces uh, a form of thinking that is philosophy, which is um, a self-sufficient, uh, auto-referential, uh, self-mirroring, etc. The same problem that uh, Laruel sees in uh, philosophy. It's uh, in its identity of the last instance uh, is addressed here. And according to Marx, uh, it comes down to the problem of subjectivity, of, cent of the centrality of the notion of subjectivity in modern philosophy. Uh, <clears throat> that leads to the uh, contradiction uh, of, you know, the opposition idea, matter, or, you know, speculative reason, materialist reason, etc. <clears throat> So Marx claims that uh, a claim is that the fundamental problem of philosophy is precisely its subjectivism and therefore production of a thought that is one of the universal egoist or rather the human self that has abstracted itself from the physical world in the form of self-consciousness uh, and it cannot study either itself or the world objectively due to its inability to posit itself as objective reality vis-a-vis -vis other realities, third parties, so to speak. Philosophical reason culminating in Hegel's philosophy, as Marx insists, posits the objective world subjectively, that is, it submits the exterior, exterior reality to the constitution of the subject as self-consciousness. Uh, so we're talking about a structural problem here. It, it, it's not so much a matter of foundationalism uh, in this argument here that he makes. So, uh, <clears throat> It's uh, uh, to the constitution of the subject as self-consciousness, <clears throat> which in turn posited, posits itself as a self-standing entity constituting objectivity, as we find it in Hegel's phenomenology, for example. Self-consciousness treats the exterior reality or the objective world as mere material, not just matter, material of its constitution. Also, the self-standing reality or even entity of self-consciousness is to be understood as superior form of objectivity in philosophy, in particular in Hegel's philosophy, uh, which is, uh, you know, the major target of Marx's attack as uh, considered as the apex of uh, philosophical reason of uh, modern era. Um, or of his time. Uh, it is the objectivity more objective than objectivity itself. Uh, just as uh, uh, that this form of thought produces. Uh, just as in Laruel's critique, philosophy appears to produce a superior form of the real, the being. Uh, the, the philosophical notion of the being as we uh, of being as we know it since Greek philosophy, uh, which is an amphibology of the real and truth, Laruel argues, or truth as the real. So the one is indistinguishable from the other, uh, unlike uh, what happens in uh, sciences, for example. So the being, this amphibology, uh, is a real that purports to be, is a form of the real. It, it purports to be the real, a real that is more real than the real itself. Uh, now, this is a simplification of uh, uh, Laurel's argument, but uh, in a way, it's a rephrasing of a formula we will, uh, he offers in his philosophy and non-philosophy, we will find 
later arrive at later on i hope if we have time so we're not speaking here of marx being blind to the problem of noumenon or laruel's inability to recognize the foreclosure of the real but quite the contrary the foreclosure is admitted and what the thinking subject can do is submit itself to its structure and syntax and attempt to code it, mediate it, transpose it onto the plane of the transcendental or language, quite simply, recreate it as a sign, as sign. Such transpositions are the material praxis enabling the transcendental product of describing and explaining as exterior reality or the real. The description will be scientific and I will add also artistic too. If the subject is capable of conceiving itself as an objective reality, not the other way around. Uh, so if the subject is a, capable of adopting the third party's perspective. So not subspecia eternitatis, uh, not the, the, the perfect uh, scientific uh, subject of uh, Kant's positivism. It simply adopt a posture of thought that would be a third party's perspective uh, or view. I think uh, is the word that Marx uses. Such is the basis of Marx's non-anthropocentric scientific method. So you see, he is in fact far more radical in one aspect than the post-humanists because he really decentered, decenters the entire argument from anthropocent uh, away from anthrop anthropocentrism. Yet, his humanism is radical. Uh, one actually uh, has to be uh, non-centric in order to be radical. Uh, so, um, and yet, uh, so uh, non-anthropocentric scientific method, and yet again, one determined by humanity is its identity in the last instance uh, as elaborated in the chapter op uh, opposition of the materialist and idealist outlook in uh, German ideology. So seeking to establish knowledge of the exterior uh, reality in a way that mirrors the subject, both the individual and the assumed universal human subject is as already discussed a philosophical gesture par excellence. If conversely one adopts, adopts Marxist method, one should also seek to conceive of themselves as being an object to a third person's gaze amidst an objective world. Uh, to quote Marx, to be objective, natural and sensuous, and at the same time to have object, nature and sense outside oneself or oneself to be object, nature and sense for a third party is one and the same thing. A quote from his critique of Hegel's philosophy in general. To posit the contrary is to pursue philosophy, argues Marx in the German ideology. So to situate thought differently uh, according to the legislating uh, principle of subjectivity, centered thought would be to produce philosophy. Uh, <clears throat> the thought that is centered on subjectivity is essentially philosophical and this is the sufficient uh, reason, the sufficient necessary criterion to distinguish philosophy from the scientific thought and the artistic practice. The paragraph from the preface of uh, <clears throat> the preface to uh, Grundtvig's critique of political economy cited above, let us recall, is Marx's testament that 
the German ideology should be considered as the crystallization of Marxist and Engels' critique of philosophy. So they never abandoned that. Uh, and Lenin's resurrection of uh, philosophy amidst uh, uh, Marxist and Engels' opus is actually uh, distortion of Marxist uh, and Engels' original intention, whether they accomplished uh, this goal of you know, moving further and further away from philosophy is one question, but that the fact that this was the vector, we, this was the tendency, um, is something that is explicitly stated in, uh, by both of them, and uh, they do call it crystallization of uh, uh, of uh, the intention of the entire work work so in it he seems to have radicalized instead of instead of abandoned his scientific humanism and the exit from philosophy or the transcendence of its auto fetishism remains the prerequisite of such a project german criticism has um, okay this is a quote i'll, I'll skip it from Marx, uh, because there isn't enough time. Uh, so nature, life, and physicality resurface uh, constantly in this uh, uh, work uh, that, I, <laughs> that I skipped the quote from. Uh, but uh, also uh, the same insistence uh, uh, reappears in German ideology, as I said, the part on, on Feuerbach. So, and as I said in the manifesto, we, we find the same argument. We find this themes uh, as recurring in Capital, Grundrisse, we said it at the beginning. So the very structure of thought, uh, uh, by the very structure of thought, subjectivity as the organizing principle of an analysis or a theory induces anthropomorphism or atav atavistic humanism. Individuation conceived in materialist terms, on the other hand, is determined by matter or its elements to which it inevitably dissolves, as we read in the paragraph from Grundrisse quoted above. Individuation is praxis of the matter and the individual life form, including human, it is not a process that could predetermine the elements or atoms by, uh, but always their result. Uh, the unruliness of the real is the thesis Marx defended since his dissertation on atomism, the defense of the Epicurean principle of klinamen in Greek atomism. The argument is similar to that made by Simon Don. Forms do not pre-exist matter and its movement. They are not fixed and separated from matter or simply the individual does not pre-exist individuation as Simon Don argues. Simon Don argues. So to speak of post-humanism in the way critical uh, theory does today, uh, relying on uh, the post-structuralist episteme is still human-centered. On the other hand, to advocate Marxian humanism is to advocate a science of a particular form of reality and history, that of the human species, and an instance of individuation materially and historically conditioned, which has its own and unique morphology and identity in the last instance. It is one among the many subject matters of scientific inquiry. And to name it human is not about anthropomorphism of thought and human centeredness, quite to the contrary, but rather about identifying in the last instance, the object of inquiry as determined by a particular configura configuration of materiality. Um, 
So I propose to radicalize the concept by distinguishing it from philosophical post-enlightenment humanism, but also by submitting it in the last instance to the material real of humanity and have thus termed it non-human in line with Laruelle's uh, uh, non-philosophy, uh, but there isn't time to elaborate it. Uh, I guess I should just uh, jump to the conclusion. Let me see where it is. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll skip several passages and I'll read this one, the last one, and conclude on time. So speaking in terms of Marxian materialism and non-philosophical realism, uh, which is uh, a combination of uh, Laruel, primarily Laruel, uh, Laruel's non-standard philosophy uh, and uh, Marx to some extent, the identity in the last instance is materially determined. It can mutate, but the mutation must be the product of a mediated materiality rather than imposed imprint of some self-standing form detached from the real as material. If the identity in the last instance at issue is the human, it is treated as any other identity in the last instance. That is in its radical finitude rather than in terms of hegemonic expansion. The possible mutations of form are subject to determination in the last instances material or more specifically, they are information. Thus the concept of information in our discussion as material determined rather than in terms of the transcendental and the imminent, which are categories that can be applied on material and immaterial re reality depending on the type of theorization but cannot serve as determination in the last instance. Therefore, a non-anthropocentric post-humanism would radicalize the human and construe a discourse of humanity in scientific terms, determined and delineated by the finitude of the reality of humanity. Okay, thank you, Katrina, for your intervention. I sort of really, really sort of appreciate that. Um, so, now it's time to hand over to Ian James for his response. Hello, Katerina. Thank you for your wonderful presentation and I really enjoyed reading the, uh, the chapter. Um, so I want what follows to be um, as a response to Katerina Kolosova's thoughts on subjectivity, philosophy and capitalism uh, to be a tribute to those thoughts by way of a tarrying along a parallel, but I would hope a complementary path. The path taken, as has been clear from the previous presentation, leads from Hegel to Marx, to Laruel's non-Marxism, and from there in Kolosova to her formulations around Marxian humanism and what she has called a post-philosophical radicalized metaphysics of socialism. The parallel path along which I want to tarry passes alongside her reading of Hegel, Marx and Laruel, but has as its prospective point of issue, the questioning, the further questioning of a possible non-philosophical communism and of community. The tribute to be paid here is to the way in which Kolosova's brilliant reading of Marx after Laruel restores him comprehensively to his radicality that of a passage beyond the ideality of philosophy, a passage taken in the name of a material real. Kolosova identifies a perfect homology between Marx's science, understood as a shift out of philosophy, as epitomized by Hegel, and Laruel's understanding of non-philosophy, understood as a science or theory of the real. Both draw on the materials of philosophy, as Kolosova says, but do so understanding that these materials are determined unilaterally by the materiality of the real in the last instance. They do not themselves determine the real, but are determined by it. 
What ultimately results from this homology between Marx and Laruelle is the equation of philosophy, Hegelian absolute spirit, and the world form of capital, understood all as informed by, and in turn informing, a totalizing logic of subjectivity. In its desired fulfillment, this totalizing subjectivity negates, sacrifices, or otherwise annihilates the material bodies of animal life, human and non-human alike. Kolosova's revolution of multiple acts, her conception of the revolt of suffering bodies, and her renewal of socialism, understood as the abolition of surplus value, are of such signal contemporary importance because they seek to establish both a political practice, <clears throat> because they seek to establish both as a political practice which decisively does not seek its foundation or legitimation from within philosophy, but rather engages a defense of the material real itself against philosophy, understood in its equivalence with the world form of capital. My tribute then, Katerina, boils down to this. Anyone who thinks that they want to take the reading of Marx and his legacy seriously in the early 21st century needs to take this non-philosophical dimension of Marx's writings seriously, and this to the utmost degree. The price of retrieving some kind of socialist practice or program must be that of thinking both, as Kolosova does so forcefully, post-philosophically. Why is this so important? The answer, I think, <clears throat> um, lies back with Hegel himself and with the fate of Hegelian thought as it is taken up by Feuerbach, Marx, and then in the history of Marxism in its profoundly conjoined philosophical and political legacies. As is well known, there is a general schema of thinking in 20th century French philosophy, of which Laruel himself is arguably very much a latter-day representative that understands Hegel, perhaps unfairly, to be the totalitarian thinker par excellence. According to this schema, Hegel is a philosopher whose conception of subjectivity, understood as the fulfillment of absolute spirit, both laid the ground for and became thereby respect, retrospectively tainted by the advent of the totalitarian state and its accompanying horrors in the first half of the 20th century. The essence of the problem here is not just the way in which Hegel's totalizing system aims towards absolute spirit in the negation and subsequent absorption of all alterity in the accomplishment of subjectivity as absolute. It is also a question of the way in which Hegel, in the philosophy of right in particular, articulates this process in a specific relation subsisting between the philosophical and the political per se. More precisely, what is at stake is the way in which Hegelian absolute spirit or the self-consciousness of world mind finds its fulfillment, its concrete effectuation in the organic community of the subject as embodied in the totality of the state form. By extension, this relation between the philosophical and the political might be at stake in one way or another in the process by which any philosophical subjectivity seeks auto-fulfillment within a political project or program. Therefore, the reality of the violence of totalitarianism, of fascism, and of the impression of the oppression and terror they unleashed from concentration camps and gulags up to and including that of mass killing and genocide was that of the effectuation of an ideal, idealized and philosophical subjectivity in and as the form of the subject state. This is in a mutated and modified form, one might add Pace, Marx, Laruel and Kolosova, also the destructive violence of capitalism. Capitalism manifests itself as a political form not unrelated to the logic of totalitarianism, to the extent that it seeks to effectuate subjectivity in the figure of homo economicus, and as produced in the self-standing form of a generalized economy of equivalence, according to which the forces of state and capital enter into the same homogenized, rapaciously totalizing 
and utterly destructive historical becoming. The equivalence posited by Kolosova after Larowell between philosophy, absolute spirit, and the world form of capital takes its place and has its contemporary imperative force when understood against the backdrop of this logic of the political effectuation of the philosophical <clears throat> and of philosophical subjectivity that is identifiable in Hegel. The lesson to be learned from this is actually quite simple. Politics does not need more philosophy. More specifically, it does not need philosophically idealized subjectivity or subjectivities, whether in the discourse of philosophy proper or as they may be manifest themselves in more pervasive everyday and intuitive worldly representations and thereby be taken as a principle of production for self-standing form and, and <clears throat> the legitimation of political programs and practices. In the light of this, one might insist that any really radical politics that would appeal to Marx should decisively not do so in order to elaborate a philosophical legitimation for a political program. The effectuation of philosophical subjectivity in a political program always obeys a logic of violence and will therefore always incline towards a repetition of the very violence of the political or economic system it seeks to overturn. This, I would argue, and obviously I'm not alone here, is the post-philosophical or non-philosophical imperative that needs to be heeded in any rethinking of socialism today. And one which is heeded in exemplary fashion, I think, in Kolosova's multiplicity of the result of suffering bodies, her conception of socialist utopia, and in her radicalized post-philosophical metaphysics of socialism. We need to continue then to return Marx to his non-philosophical root, to that which is, as it were, most radical in his thinking. That which is radical goes to the origin. And in Marx, one finds at that origin, as we have seen so well today, the thought of a material real which constitutes or determines the subject, but is not in turn determined in return by way of philosophical subjectivity. In the light of 20th century history, it is arguable that the only way towards a genuinely radical renewal of socialism passes through the non-philosophical moment in Marx. One might, say the same, might, one might say the same of any possible renewal of communism, if such a renewal could be thought possible in the light of its tainted legacy in the wake of the projects of state communism. It was Maurice Blanchot, perhaps an unlikely reference in this context, who described the communist demand as bearing most decisively on the possibility or impossibility of something like community. In the same stroke, however, he also marked the concepts communism and community together as being indelibly tainted by a background of historical disaster, which we might infer as being those of state communism and of fascism respectively. These were disasters that, he noted, have dishonored and betrayed them as concepts. A dishonor and betrayal, which one might most obviously today discern in their associations with Stalinist state terror and Nazi Volksgemeinschaft in particular. Yet it was also Jean-Luc Nancy in what would become a long and protracted dialogue with Blanchot on the subject of community, who highlighted the extent to which communism has always been and may remain emblematic of the desire for a community to be found or restored beyond social divisions, technopolitical dom domination, and the wasting of freedom and happiness imposed by an exclusive order of privatization. As long as this order of division, domination, and the wasting of freedom and happiness remain, the desire for community that was emblematic of communism must also surely persist. And yet such a desire for community is made more problematic than ever by the problem of philosophical subjectivity and its effectuation that was identified in the context of the 20th century French reading of Hegel. We might normally think of community as the holding in common <clears throat> of a subjective identity by those who share the communal bond. 
even if as a communist and not as a nationalist communitarian or as a latter-day fascist i hold that shared subjectivity to be one of belonging to humanity in general i remain beholden still to a subjectivism of the human and all the problems of philosophical objectivization humanism post-humanism and the transhuman that Kolosova has identified. Therefore, the attempt to renew a political project, which as renewed communism would instantiate a community of humans will remain bound up with the logic of effectuation with the making effective of a philosophical subjectivity in and as a political program. Can one imagine after Kolosova, something like a radical humanism of community that would, to quote her directly, submit to the materialist determination of the identity in the last instance without transforming it into ontology. I think that one can. And this by way of what I might tentatively and experimentally call a post-philosophical nominalism. Community, if it is still to be thought, and I think it is and needs to be, can be thought outside of philosophical figures <clears throat> of the universal subject and outside even an ontology of shared being or of being with, or more precisely, community can be named. For prior to our fantasies of philosophical subjectivity, our worldly representations and future projects and political imaginaries, before all these, a material wheel of bodies imminently lives, experiences, suffers in its radical finitude. Even before any necessarily philosophical distinction between human, non-human, animal, and plant within the world, a material real determines all that appears as world, whilst itself remaining radically indeterminate. Like Kolosova, I would want to take the Larowellian non-philosophical axioms concerning the real and sketch out something that might bear the name of, in this case, open imminence, and thereby yield the further name of open community. This is an imminence which, as open, must be understood axiomatically after Larowell as the real cause in the last instance of any and all opening or coming to presence of a finite communally shared world or worlds. It is an autonomous identity with itself and forever foreign to the identity of philosophical concepts and to the positioned and positionable of identities in the world as we know it or represent it. A politics that acts in the name of the lived real of open imminence does not and cannot turn this real into a philosophical subjectivity since it remains irrevocably undetermined and indeterminate, but no less imminent, real and a real cause of all that lives and comes to be in our shared world. Open community would therefore become the name which can be given to the imminent experience of the material real, real of lived bodies. If we think and act politically in the name of open community, understood as the lived imminent real and real cause in the last instance of our shared world, then we act in the name of a real that is the real unilateral cause of everything that presents itself in and as our shared world of all human and non-human being, of all that exists, both <clears throat> locally and globally. Larowell elsewhere <clears throat> in his recent ecological work has given this the name universe. What is at stake here is the possibility of naming something, open community, in such a way that it more radically and rigorously resists appropriation by philosophical subjectivity and conceptual representation. Naming something from the perspective of its imminent real means that the real is as so named does not become a philosophical self-standing form or conceptual work. Crucially, however, the real is maintained and retained uniquely and solely as the imminent and unilateral cause of that which is named. If this is a nominalism, then this is so because it is performed in the rejection of the idea that abstract identities are, or universals are in any way real. And of course, in the Larowellian context after Hegel, every presented worldly entity, object or concept is either an abstract object or a universal. 
If this is a post-philosophical nominalism, it is because that which is named here, open immanence and open community, are determined by the material real as their unilateral cause in the last instance. One might ask, to bring things to a close, in this post or non-philosophical space, why there is any imperative at all to enact a politics in the name of open imminence and of open community. Here, we simply need to remind ourselves that for Laurel, at least, non-philosophy has always been an imminent experience of lived life and has always had its core gesture, the defense of the real as imminent life and a revolt against the harassment of the world and of the world form understood in its equivalence with philosophy. A politics that would enact itself in the name of open community would do this in very, it would do this in the very non-philosophical defense of the real. This is a defense against the hallucinatory images that are imposed upon the real by philosophy, ontology, and the world form of capital, which are then offered up to politics and to political programs as their legitimating principle and as their production <clears throat> and as the principle of their production as self-standing form and objectivity. At this contemporary moment of global capitalism, it could be said above all that acting in the name of, the of open community would be a defense of the open, open imminence of the real against the deluded and destructive images of communal essence, subjectivity or fusion that provide motivating principles for nationalist, nativist, communalist, and sectarian forms of politics. It is a matter of responding to a simple and straightforward imperative, that of abandoning the illusory philosophical subjectivity uh, principle in politics in favor of the only real base of politics, that of the real itself. This post-philosophical nominalism of community can certainly ally itself and would hope to complement Kolosova's unique vision of a renewed and radicalized metaphysics of socialism. It may or may not be recognizable as a renewal of communism, but it certainly does respond to that emblematic desire of the communist promise for a naming of community to be pitched against social and national divisions, against techno-political and economic domination, and against the wasting of happiness brought about by capitalism. It gives a non-philosophical name in the name of which the struggle against all these might take place. Such a politics should be as radically militant in its defense of the imminent real of open community as the real itself is radically undetermined, indeterminate and entirely unknowable, but in the end, no less real for all that. Thank you. So, uh, we have two people already, so uh, Sagnik, I think was first, I hope, you, I hope I've said your name correctly, so please. So there was a really great paper and uh, Professor James' response was also illuminating. I just wanted to ask, I, it was not clear to me how when you said that Marx was not blind to the notion of noumena and for, for closure, could you please explicate that part a little bit more? Uh, how what Marx's notion, like how Marx was not blind to the notion of Newman and, and foreclosure. Thank you. Well, uh, the point uh, was that um, actually Marx does not open this question because this question would be a Kantian discussion that he does not even enter. Uh, into uh, 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 into that sort of a discussion. So technically speaking, he does not tackle the problem of Kantian noumenon. If we're talking in the uh, strict sense of uh, the term, uh, this notion as conceived in Kant's uh, philosophy. Um, uh, the point was uh, that it's indirectly clear that uh, there, there isn't this naivete that uh, the real itself uh, in and of itself can be penetrated, uh, grasped fully by philosophical thought. This type of, uh, you know, unity of thought 
and uh, the real, uh, that is uh, the object of uh, study, uh, unified into the notion of, you know, a philosophical truth where one cannot distinguish the one uh, from the other thought from uh, the real. So this type of reasoning uh, culminating in, in this uh, form of um, uh, cognitive result, let's put it that way, or in uh, the form of truth, as in philosophical truth, um, is an ambition that is uh, that's pertaining uh, by definition to the philosophical form of thought. That's that is the argument here. In this argument, I'm departing from Laruelle's analysis of what philosophy is all about. And his uh, problem, uh, or, or his diagnosis of, you know, the underlying problem of all philosophy, philosophy in general, or if you wish, uh, in the radical sense of the word, uh, word, it's identity of the last distance and in uh, Althusserian sense, uh, comes down to what Laurel calls terms, uh, the problem of the philosophical decision or what we uh, became accustomed to calling philosophical decisionism as uh, the key issue that uh, Laruel, for example, grapples, grapples uh, uh, with and uh, a problem um, of philosophy's constitution, he uh, directs his entire attack uh, um, against. So from this vantage point, uh, philosophy seen as uh, this phenomenon of self-circumscribed, uh, um, self-sufficient, auto-mirroring uh, thought that you know uh, engulfs the real in a way by way of postulating and, to, and, and then dealing with its postulate of the real. So this is a posture of thought, uh, Laruel argues, that is uh, defining of any and all philosophy. Uh, whereas in science, uh, uh, Laruel insists, uh, there is this um, uh, affirmation of the radical foreclosure of the real, uh, this uh, fact is not denied, so there is no ambition to penetrate the real, to speak on behalf of the real, from the point of the real, to speak as a Deleuzian with an in immanent uh, voice or what, whatever from the position of uh, the immanent. What Laruel insists in that we can speak uh, of the real, uh, we can create, therefore, uh, Signification, language, you know, a process of signification or language around the real or of the real that can be affected by immanence, so the real, but not uh, 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 something that uh, happens uh, on the terrain of immanence. So so from that side of the real. So there is no this ambition of penetration uh, in the territory of the real. So the foreclosure is admitted. And from that point on, uh, as soon, so, so this is a uh, this posture of th thought he's talking about uh, is in a way a metaphysical choice. And uh, my interpretation or summarization of um, uh, Laurel's argument is that, uh, the scientific uh, uh, posture of thought uh, takes the following uh, uh, metaphysical decision. So the real as such, especially as an abstraction, as something in and of itself, uh, as if, you know, uh, a sort of a nousia, uh, as such, it's uh, admitted to be outside impenetrable, impossible to be reached in and of itself. The, the, uh, uh, the scientific form of thought does not even have that uh, ambition. Uh, but it still admits that there is this ex exterior re reality that does have the status of uh, the real, 
uh, that philosophy or metaphysics would ascribe to this exteriority. So it is in a way real what science uh, um, describes, seeks to explain. Uh, so there is already a metaphysical choice there in the scientific position or posture as Laurel uh, calls it of thought. Uh, but the ambition is that it, it can uh, submit itself to be affected by its immanence to paraphrase uh, Lorwell. So it can account of it, it can uh, uh, code it, let's put it figuratively that way, or it can code the effects of the real, uh, map a certain syntax of uh, these symptoms of the real, let's uh, uh, conceive of it in uh, the Lacanian sense. After all, even Laruel says that uh, he is actually building on uh, Lacan's notion of the real. So if, if we agree that this is the position of scientific thought, now we arrive at, at Marx. So I had to go through Laruel in order to answer to your question. That this is the whole point. So uh, if we agree with this reading of Laurel as to what constitutes philosophy and what constitutes uh, science, and it's all determined by a relation to the real, then we see in uh, Marx's uh, uh, thinking and writing a position that does not sink into the naive uh, that's why I think that this uh, absence of naivete toward the noumenon is implied in Marx, because we do not see an ambition in Marx to penetrate uh, the real, control the real, speak from the position of the real, uh, you know, uh, produce uh, a truth that would be, uh, in fact, a unity of uh, the real and thought. So, truth in the philosophical sense of the word. Uh, he keeps insisting that, uh, first of all, we should exit philosophy. And throughout his work, it's implied. Uh, no, it's not just implied. It, it, he is explicit. Throughout his uh, work, uh, he's explicit that, uh, you know, um, Marxism should exit uh, philosophy because philosophy actually produces the same problem uh, that, Laruel identified, I don't want to take too much of your time and repeat, repeat the same uh, thing one, once again. Uh, so he identifies the same problem as Laruel, just in different words. That's why he seeks for a uh, to establish a science of species is being of humanity instead of philosophy. His, uh, um, uh, his ambition is to produce a form of thought that would submit to the real end practice rather than philosophy and its uh, principle of self-sufficiency. So this very ambition to exit philosophy for the same reasons, very similar or analogous reasons to those of uh, Laruel implies that he is not naive about uh, the noumenon because he does not even take that path, you know. Um, a philosopher would. So he is already uh, in a process of establishing a scientific uh, system of thought, which simply abandoned the, abandons the uh, ambition to speak on behalf of the noumenon. Uh, so the, the, this very ambi uh, scientific ambition of thought, uh, the ambition of you know uh, exiting philosophy implies the absence of this naivete I, I mentioned. So it's uh, uh, the, the trouble is that the piece I read is part of a book, and there it's explained at length. So it's kind of assumed what, what I mean by that. But here. I had to respond and it took a lot of time, I'm sorry. Uh, it was a complex question, so I had to, you know, offer <laughs> as much as I could. It's okay, thank you. I think we may have time thank for you. one more question. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, so sorry, Sonia. Um, so we have uh, one question from Conrad Hamilton, um, please. Okay. 
Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, obviously, I, you know, I think this is a, a very uh, brilliant, uh, you know, conception uh, of Marx's work. And uh, before we talked a little bit about, um, you know, what I feel maybe is, is part of the difficulty here, um, which has to do with the role of process in dialectic um, and maybe, um, you know, the contrast with that uh, in Lauerwell's method. Um, but I don't want to dwell on that now. Instead, what I think would be interesting maybe to bring up would be the fact that um, you talk about, um, you know, Marx in terms of, uh, you know, the assumption of uh, the sort of scientific posture and how uh, the result of this is that the notion of the human uh, is only sort of reprised insofar uh, as there's a kind of secular content to it, uh, or uh, that is to say, uh, you know, it's reprised outside of uh, the kind of uh, uh, spiritualizing ideals that we might affix, uh, you know, to what sort of, you know, in the vein of maybe how humanism would be conventionally understood. Um, and I, like, I agree quite, quite, quite totally with that. And I think there are, you know, passages in Marx's work that completely affirm this. Um, I just wonder, you know, and it has to do with the way that our understanding of, of you know, uh, natural sciences and the human itself are, are sus up to, to consistent changes. I just wonder how, whether Marx in trying to uh, postulate a kind of secular notion of the human, um, I wonder whether he's ever able to affect the kind of rupture that he's aiming for. And, and if, he's, if he isn't able to, then I think that we have to conclude, um, you know, along the lines of what Louis Althusser has said, uh, that Marx, uh, you know, never fully accomplishes this kind of, uh, uh, you know, scientific rupture that it's kind of process. And I, I just want to cite two examples really quickly. I don't want to drag this out too much. But um, one example, I think, of where Marx is kind of trying to, you um, postulate the human in a secular way, but maybe gets, you know, a bit tangled up is when he talks about the labor process in the first volume of Capital, right? When he says that, um, you know, the exact words at my disposal, but basically he says that, you know, what differentiates, uh, you know, humans compared to bees, right? Is that when they build things, they have a, um, a notion that they establish in advance uh, of what their sort of construction will resemble like an architect, right? In contrast to the sort of um, construction based on instinct. And it's interesting because Pistone has, has said that in this respect, Marx, Marx imputes to, to individuals characteristics of capital. You know, in the same time in, in the Grünrisse, um, you can see this combat between sort of a, a dialectical materialist approach and a throwback to Marx's earlier and more simplistic kind of, kind of humanism, where Marx tries to establish a notion in a way of like original property um, so he says, well, the inorganic body of man includes the land and the soil. But if we have serfdom or slavery, then the person becomes part of the inorganic body of someone else. And there's this kind of idea that this is un unacceptable, but of course it ends up being quite anthropocentric in a way, right? Uh, because of the way that nature ends up being assimilated, um, you know, to the, the notion of the inorganic body of the individual in some kind of um, primordial context. In which respect we could say that Marx is also um, imputing uh, certain characteristics of capital uh, to the individual. So, so I guess my question would just be, do you think that, do you think that we can see this process as ever really reaching fruition? Or do you think it's just something that Marx has in mind, but that, but that the articulation sometimes eludes him? Or do you think it's something that has to be continued? And I'm just wondering about how you see your work. I mean, do you see it as an interpretation or do you see it as, as fulfilling something, the blueprint for which is there but it isn't necessarily fully consummated, if you understand me. Yeah. Um, well, Conrad, um, first of all, I don't think that uh, his uh, scientific conception of uh, the species being of uh, humanity comes down to uh, a secular notion of the human. Uh, quite to the contrary, he actually reject, uh, rejects the notion of secularism uh in the jewish question uh where he problematizes the alienation of uh the hegelian notion of uh, uh 
of the state, even in the the left uh, among the left young uh, Hegelians, he recognizes the same problem: uh, the problem of alienation of state, the form of state, and its purely political notion, which he sees as problematic uh, on the uh, on the one hand, and the civil society, as he calls it, on the other hand, where everything private from the private sphere is supposed to take place. So we have at the same, uh, so we have already this problem of split and alienation, which, uh, which is a problem of capitalism that resurfaces uh, constantly as well. I forgot to mention this one, the, the, the issue of alienation, uh, it is throughout, uh, you know, a problem raised throughout his works. It, it, it is at the center of capital itself. So there is no young and mature uh, Marx in uh, this sense. So anyway, going back to uh, the notion of secular in uh, uh, Marx. So the, uh, the problem is uh, derives from Hegel basically, uh, this division between state and civil society and the private uh, realm on the one hand and the state on the other hand. So he says that, uh, you know, the citizen in this uh, uh, or organization of society uh, in the, uh, this, uh, along these two poles of state and uh, the civil society, uh, we have uh, an alienated citizen, alienated from his private self and a private self uh, alienated from citizenship, uh, and along, uh, and here is the key problem with you know the liberal democratic, uh, rather right wing or left wing notion of uh, state and uh, civil society. Uh, he advocates for some kind of imminent uh, link uh, between society and state and and for a state that would be. Uh, um, a uh, an emanation of uh, of an emanation of what's imminent to a society, um, and in this respect, within these frameworks of uh, discussion, he says that this uh, uh, that the state always, in fact, remains a Christian state, even what when called secular along the lines of this division. Uh, the constitution is always already Christian uh, because what provides, let's say the imaginary foundation, the base of this purely abstract political state is the Christian society, predominantly Christian society. And it is transposed to this purely uh, political notion of the state. Second of all, uh, in, uh, it is uh, this notion of the state is also uh, the product of uh, philosophy in the form he problematizes and uh, its apex being or uh, culmination being Hegel, which is already a continuation of you know, Christian theology. So uh, actually uh, the notion of secularism is misleading. And uh, he does not advocate for a secular state. Of course, he, he says that, you know, the religion is the opium for the masses, etc. But on the, on the other hand, uh, uh, first of all, it's, it's part of a different uh, elaboration, different argument. It's nothing anti-religion, uh, that argument there. And uh, on the other hand, he says that, uh, you know, in a pre-communist state, uh, let's say in a capitalist state that is organized along this division, uh, you know, a religion is uh, something which is less alienating than, you know, this pure statehood and the citizenship that derives from it. So his scientific notion of the human not only does not come down to secularism, but he actually problematizes secularism and uh, he, sees the, he sees it elsewhere. I mean, you, we know each other well and you're familiar with my work, you know 
what I'm hinting to, but we're past the time, so I have to stop here. I just wanted to say that, that you know, scientific and secular, that's not the same, it's not in, in Marx. Okay, so thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Conrad, uh, and certainly for your questions. Um, so it only remains uh, for me to say thank you again to uh, Katrina um, for a wonderful talk and, and Ian, and sort of uh, great sort of response as well and to the questions and to everyone uh, turning up today. And so I wish you all a good week and uh, goodbye. Agreed. Thanks a yeah. lot. Well, thanks thank to you. everybody. Bye. Bye then.